Let's talk about the arrow of time and how it relates to spontaneous processes. So let's imagine that we have a table and a ball, a tennis ball maybe. We bounce the ball. So at first it has potential energy and as it falls down it loses potential energy, it gains kinetic energy. It's kind of squished at the bottom so it gains elastic potential energy. Then it bounces back with kinetic energy and it keeps bouncing and it bounces and bounces and eventually it stops bouncing. We just have a ball sitting on top of the table. Now, I think you're comfortable with the idea that what we did is we started off with potential energy. And then at the end, energy wasn't really destroyed because we know that the ball is a little bit warmer and the table and the room are a little bit warmer than we started. So we just took potential energy and turned it into internal energy. We know internal energy it's just the energy of the microscopic motions of the individual atoms and molecules in the, the table and the, the tennis ball. Great. So energy was conserved. We just changed what kind of, of form it was in. Okay. Now, I want you to imagine the reverse process. The ball sitting on the table, and it's warm. And we'll label that to say that the ball ended up being a little bit warmer than it was as a higher temperature and that maybe it was cool when we started. Okay, the temperature difference would probably be a tiny fraction of a degree C, but nevertheless, it would be slightly warmer. Now, I want you to imagine, what about going backwards? What about starting with a warm ball sitting on the table, and the ball just starts bouncing and cools off? Can we do this process? Well, would it violate conservation of energy? No we'd just be turning internal energy into potential energy. So there's nothing about conservation of energy that would forbid this from happening. And yet, if you did see a warm tennis ball at rest on a table start to bounce, you would think that was very odd. It would seem like you're looking at a movie being run backwards. So in fact, we know that we actually don't see this happen. In fact, what we do see is things going in this direction. We'll call this direction the arrow of time. And processes that happen in this direction, this naturally happen without any uh, outside influence. We don't have to do anything to get the ball to stop bouncing. It just naturally does. We're going to call naturally go forward with the flow of time as spontaneous. A spontaneous process is one that just continues forward with the natural flow of time. So we have to ask ourselves, why is a ball going from high potential energy to high internal energy? Why is that spontaneous? But the reverse process is not spontaneous. So why is that? Because obviously it's nothing to do with conservation of energy. Let's consider a few more spontaneous processes. Let's imagine that we have an ice cube and we're going to take it at say 25 degrees C. We know what's going to happen. We're going to end up with just a puddle of, of water. On the other hand, we know that if we have a puddle of water and we're working at negative 25 degrees C, it's going to end up freezing. So it might not form a nice ice cube, but it's going to form, I'll just say, ice. So I can't draw a frozen puddle as well as I can an ice cube. Okay, so freezing is spontaneous if we're at negative 25 degrees C. Melting is spontaneous at 25 degrees C because we're on either side of the melting point. So those are examples of spontaneous processes. Another one would be, imagine that you had a box and we had a divider in the box and we had, say, helium gas over here and argon over here. And if we pull out the divider, we know it's going to be spontaneous. Those two gases are going to mix and we're just going to end up with a mix of the different gases. And that's not because of any interaction. We know that these are all gases and 
the interactions in gases at normal temperatures and pressures are negligible. So it's nothing to do with intermolecular forces or anything like that. There's something else that's making this go to the right. And in fact, if we started off with a box of mixed gas, like air, which is a mixture of oxygen and nitrogen predominantly, if suddenly we found half the room had one gas and half the room had the other gas, that would be odd, right? All of a sudden, all the oxygen in the room is on the left-hand side and the people on the right-hand side are gasping because they don't have any oxygen. That would be odd. We don't expect to see that. Instead, we expect that only this direction is spontaneous. And the same thing here. If we saw uh, ice forming at a high temperature, like 25 degrees C, that would be odd. We wouldn't expect to see that. So all of these things, the arrow of time points to the right, and so spontaneous is to the right. So a spontaneous process, you can just think of this as a process that happens by itself. It doesn't need any kind of outside intervention. Or to make it happen, it just happens. So the question is, why? Well, we know we had to put heat into this ice cube to get it to melt. So if this was one mole of water, uh, that would take uh, roughly six kilojoules, right? Because we know that six kilojoules per mole is the heat of fusion of ice. So it would take six kilojoules to melt this ice. If it was one mole, if it was two moles, it would take 12 kilojoules, etc. Well, if we do the reverse process, if we're going to freeze water, we know it's going to give off heat when it freezes, and it will give off heat in exactly the same proportion. If it's one mole, it give off six kilojoules. If it's two moles, 12 kilojoules, etc. So it's not the energy. The energy exchange is the same in both of them, right? Either the ice is going to be absorbing heat and melting, or the water is going to be releasing heat and freezing. But the question is, why does it only go in one direction? Right? Because you could envision a process where the ice suddenly absorbed, uh, absorbed heat at negative 20 degrees C and, and, and melted, right? But we just never see that. We never see water. We never see ice below freezing just melt by itself. So the question is, why do all these arrows go to the right? And the answer to that question will be discussed in the next video.